I started to read uh, 10 or 15 years ago a lot from Clay Christensen at the Harvard Business School and his whole theories around innovation. And are we just overthinking the problem? I guess is my question to you. Is it really, is, is it, are, we, are, are we better off being a, a piece of carbon paper or a, a mimeograph machine or a, a, you know, a, a photocopy machine and just say, let's see what's working elsewhere and let's just figure out how to make it work here? Copy and apply what works is always the best formula for making things better at the lowest risk because you've got the proof that it's worked elsewhere. And so the only, quote, only thing that is left is to appropriately understand how and why it's worked elsewhere, make the appropriate minimal changes that are required Mm -hmm. to make it work in your area, and then find the right uh, partner in place to make it work where you've actually got people who in organizations that want you to succeed. And that is very important. Sometimes it requires, you know, working within something that exists like the Medicare Advantage stuff. And in other cases, it requires being more out there. So we've got a, a company that we've already exited from that we were involved in from the beginning called Aspire Health. Uh, They've been uh, acquired by Anthem, but we were very early at the beginning. And we've since cooperated with uh, Brad Smith, the head of that, on other other healthcare things that are working out really well. But to go to Aspire, there's a huge fraction of healthcare dollars are spent at end of life. So the question is, um, you know, what can you do about that? You know, the important thing isn't the dollars. The important thing is making end of life be, first of all, further out, and second of all, as um, untorturous to right. the person whose life is at an end, coming to an end as possible. And the usual pattern is a, is a nightmare for the person who's getting old. They bounce to emergency rooms. They they go back. They there's all sorts of problems. Most people who are getting older who may have multiple problems, really want to, uh, they'd like, if possible, to live out the rest of their lives in at home or in a caring place that isn't too much like, you know, a hospital. And so what Aspire Health did was figure out, and any, any old person, you know, if you've ever had the experience, which I have, if you've got an old person who wants to avoid this issue, and you're like the son or daughter or whatever of that person, figuring out how to get health, home health care and help with the meals and help with everything is is a nightmare. It's really hard to figure out how to do that, where to go, how to get it paid for, et cetera, et cetera. So what Aspire did was say, we're going to set up a service so that for those people who want, we will introduce them to our service, we'll give them a concierge, will involve the old person and their relatives, their significant Mm -hmm. others, will give them this opportunity. If they don't want it, fine, no problem. But if they do want it, we will be be their concierge and helping arrange everything for them to suit their needs and adapt to their needs as those needs change over time. And we'll just make it all happen. And uh, they worked, Aspire's genius was that they worked with some people at Anthem, the, the insurer, and they started by talking to uh, Anthem in purely financial terms. They did some modeling. Hmm. How much are the people in this population costing you versus how much do you think they could cost under this model? And it looked like the Aspire model would, co- would cost Anthem one heck of a mountain less money. So Anthem said, sure, what the heck? If it does patients, you know, right. good, that's nice, but it sure is going to do, you know, it's going to save us a lot of money, and we're, we're all for that. And so leaving out lots of details, right. they tried it out. Not everybody went for it, but an amazing fraction of people went for it. 
And they, they did the typical thing of applying it first in the Nashville, Tennessee area, which is where they were based, so that they could get coverage, so that right. they could get all the providers and get everybody together, et cetera. And they'd expand out to another geographical area and another and another. And people were loving it. And everybody loved it. The patients, the patients' relatives loved it. Uh, Anthem loved it. it. There was nobody who was against it. So that's a classic example of a brand new idea that was not really stolen from another mm, industry. Mm -hmm. Right. Although sort of, you know, mod it was more extreme. That, that falls into a pattern of it's not one of the fashionable things that people who talk about innovation are all talking about. But it really is a new idea. And it is one that we backed and that worked. Right. And as to the pattern of innovation, one of the things that you've noticed, and I completely endorse what you said, but let me point out something else. Innovation, like much else in technology and other things, has fashions. Yeah. People don't think of it as having fashions, but there are fashions. And being fashionable is correlated with having prestige. And so everybody wants to be prestigious, and so they want the fashion. So there's the fashion of big data. Mm -hmm. So everybody needs to do big data. And the vast majority of the big data efforts have failed <laughs> because they're focusing on a solution, not the problem. Um, there's a spectrum of innovations that are out there ranging from exotic technologies like big data all the way down to simple stuff like clean rooms more effectively so that there's less people getting infected with hospital-borne infections. So there's this spectrum. And it turns out that all of the exotic innovation people tend to be attracted to the fashionable exotic end of the spectrum. And a lot of things that win are not exotic at all. So with the patient experience in mind, can you talk about an exceptional patient experience that you've had? I had... Um, let me talk about one that I haven't written about very briefly. I discovered that I had a, uh, a lump that wasn't painful, but it was still a lump underneath my shoulder blade. So I went into my primary care and they said, oh yes, it's probably this thing called a desmoid tumor. Very rare kind of thing. I own a couple of thousand a year in the US. And I was very impressed, very, very impressed by primary care uh, physician who knew what it was. Amazing, mm. astounding. But then it turned out that what's a referral to? A referral to somebody who doesn't know about those things and doesn't do anything about them. And then I got to the next person and the next person. And the referral sort of thing was just a nightmare. So finally I took it in charge of it myself. And I found somebody who actually was working on these things. <laughs> that nobody else that I talked to, even though they knew the name of the disease, hmm. had bothered to look up and find that there was somebody in New York City who was specializing in the treatment of this very disease that I had. So I called the person up, I got an appointment. Oh yes, we know what it is. Uh, oh yes, we've got this experimental drug. It's not experiment, it's a, it's a drug that only has a 25% success rate and it's not normally prescribed for this thing. But after all, what's normal for something that only happens a couple thousand times a year? So he prescribed it to me. I went to the infusion center uh, for a number of weeks. And boom, I was on the lucky end of the 25%. And it dramatically receded to almost nothing. So that's both a negative, mm -hmm, <laughs> a negative mm -hmm. at the beginning, a positive at the beginning, the right diagnosis, a string of right. negatives, how do you get it fixed? To a string of, oh my God, there's this amazing doctor out there who happens to be studying this thing who's doing the right thing, to an amazing positive. And then on the tail end of that, I'm now doing the follow-up to that, where, same disease, where <clears throat> It cropped up again. I had to get some radiation treatment to make it go away. I had the radiation treatment. It's supposed to have made it go away, and it didn't, so I get MRIs. So just the whole process, which I've most recently read about, written about, to uh, you would think that 
my doctor or the insurance company would know that I'm, you know, getting MRIs for this thing on a regular basis. Somebody would alert me. No, the burden's on me. Second, I call up the, the email, call up the doctor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, you only get attention. The, the, the phone calls didn't work. Finally, with email, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Well, will you please let me make my own appointment? Um, yes, yes. Yeah, we'll do it. Weeks pass. Finally, I get the notice. An appointment has been made for you on this date. <laughs> Forget about making your own appointment. Right. You know, Take think it about anything it. else. Think about it making right. a, a reservation at a restaurant. The restaurant deigns to give you a reservation <laughs> at this time in the future. Um, so then I finally get it. I rearrange my schedule so I can make it. It's And then just one thing after another, I get a reminder call and a reminder email uh, that doesn't bother to tell me where and when. <laughs> when have you ever gotten that? I get reminders. I just went out to eat last night. I got a reminder from the reservation system of the restaurant reminding me, oh, you've got this, you know, blah, blah, blah. Nope, not from the healthcare system, not even from the veterinarian. So I finally got it. I finally showed up. So I get there. I get through the MRI. If you've been through an MRI, you know that you're lying and trying not to move, moving back and forth. There's incredibly loud noise is going at you. So I get most of the way through. It stops. The tech comes in and he says, I've been looking at your, at your past records. Where's your tumor? So I explained it to him. He said, oh, well, we're going to have to stop this oh, no. because we're not doing the uh, we're not doing the image on the right place in your shoulder. Oh, really? Oh, no, the, the order says, you know, blah, blah, MRI shoulder. And what you've really got is one way on the inside of it near your um, uh, near your spine. Your spinal cord. Yeah. And we're not covering that. Oh, and geez. this machine can't do that. I said, Oh, my God. And thank you so much for checking that. And it, it all worked out. I got to another tech. And I was so grateful and polite and nice to them for, uh, you know, doing this and saving me from all the trouble it would have been. But think about it. This is the very same MRI that I've had in the past. All the doctor or his assistants had to do was copy the work order. Right. And all the insurance company had to do when doing the pre-auth was say, what's going on here? It's different than the last one we gave the authorization for. You know, no, you're doing the wrong thing. Neither the doctor nor the insurance company bothered to check the records to see if it was doing the right thing. It was only because of an, of an alert tech who was going right. above and beyond what his job was. Right. And that is like prime example. And then, you know, it doesn't end there where I, I finally want to get my pre-auth. I can't get it. I finally want to get my record. And damn it, I am paying for the contents of my medical records, me or my insurance company, it doesn't matter. Right. You may be holding them on my behalf. So think about going to a tailor, which I wrote about this, and ordering a custom suit. And you pay for it, and they've done the suit, and then you go and you say to the tailor, okay, I'm ready, I want my suit now. And they say, sorry, I can't give it to you. <laughs> It's over here. It's a beautiful suit. You can try it on, yeah. but you can't leave with it. Exactly. Yeah. And oh, well, why not? Where is it? Oh, it's this other department. How do I get to them? Oh, well, here's their phone number. Try. Can't try, try, try. Can't answer, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, they're closed. Oh, their door is broken. Oh, et cetera, et cetera. So getting your own records from the system is like, it's so maddening. It's like, it should be a crime. They should be prosecuted for withholding data that is yours. It's astounding. So there's so, just that one little experience of getting an MRI that I've had before showed so many things that were wrong from the uh, getting to the doctor, getting the schedule, getting the schedule when I wanted it, getting notification of the schedule, getting the reminder getting the right order being done by the, the, the doctor having been checked by the insurance company, neither of them did it right. And then finally getting the data that was my data, either of the order that was placed or of the results of the 
of the reading by the radiologist. All of that was an inexcusable problem. And it had nothing to do with medical competence, this, right. that, and the other thing. Right. It had to do all with the administration and the mechanics of the people and the computer systems that are involved. And it's such a tiny little insignificant thing in the overall scheme of things. But every element of that is experienced in a similarly negative way with far worse consequences by literally millions of people in our systems. And why nobody out there is making it priority number one, waking up all every day and spending all day solving those problems is beyond me. People are just not dealing with appropriate sense of urgency about what's going on here. We are doing what we can at CFT to make those incremental changes that we are able to, that are practical, where we won't just go out there and be like your typical innovator. It sounds good, but right, it doesn't right. work and it makes no difference. It doesn't matter if it doesn't make a difference. But there are, in that sense, there are things that are broken. They can all be fixed. And they all should be fixed with a sense of urgency and the people in charge of the systems should have a sense of urgency about fixing these systems that make things hard and for everybody involved every day. And I'm just pleased and proud. And I'm obviously angry <laughs> about the lack of urgency for fixing the problems that are there and about the lack of initiative taken by the people in charge to do their damn jobs right. But on the other hand, I'm grateful for the wonderful job that individuals scattered throughout the system are doing as best they can within horrible constraints mm -hmm. every day to deliver the best results they can to the people that they work with, like those techs in the MRI. And I am grateful to be able to contribute in a small way to the people who are actually bringing about effective and practical incremental changes that really do make a difference in people's lives. And when the people who are experienced with them at any level, providers, patients, workers, uh, et cetera, and investors, if it doesn't get paid for, it doesn't work, right. um, then I'm, I'm just so grateful and pleased that at least some things are going in the right direction. Well, David, I, I really appreciate your time. I think we're going to leave this episode here. We could continue this for, for quite some time. And I'm hoping that you'll you'll give us the, the pleasure of having you back at some point in time so we can discuss some some other issues.